a pleasure to introduce a colleague and a friend of mine, um, Dr. Renato Oliveira. Um, Dr. Oliveira is the, the chief of the mental health unit of, for the Pan American Health Organization uh, in Washington, DC. And uh, as a result, um, we rely heavily on him and his unit um, with all mental health uh, issues um, within the Americas. Um, obviously being unit chief, she, you know, he also uh, uh, has implications in, in terms of um, uh, modeling for WHO as a whole, all the unit chiefs and their directors also uh, 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 have, have a role. So without um, uh, you know, saying you know, too much, and because we, we, we've lost about 10 minutes, um, I, would, oh, I would leave the floor for Dr. Uh, Oliveira to uh, give us his presentation. Um, Dr. Oliveira, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Aducro. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and with all the colleagues who are present here today. It's such an, an important uh, conference about a very important topic uh, these days. So I'm really pleased to be able to share uh, our thoughts here from the Pan-American Health Organization, how we see uh, mental health in the region, uh, the advances that we've had, uh, the challenges that we still face and the impact of COVID on the mental health of populations and, and, and what we have observed uh, and uh, what we uh, advise uh, countries to, to do and uh, ways to move uh, uh, forward. Uh, I, I'm very sorry that today, by coincidence, the internet here collapsed. So I'm on my phone, uh, on, on my Wi-Fi, uh, in case there is any connection problem. So please uh, 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 forgive me. Uh, I was, uh, and as I'm on my phone, I know I'm not able to share my PowerPoint, but, I, but I, as I'm able to see here in my screen, I will be using it for, for my guidance and to conduct the presentation with you. So let's start it. I think it's very important that we, we, we try to present a, a picture of where we are as a region in terms of, of, of mental health. And it's a very uh, brief uh, uh, picture, but I hope it gives you about an idea in terms of the challenges that we have been facing even before uh, uh, COVID. We know that mental neurological substance use disorders and suicide, they, they represent one third of the burden uh, related to, to disability in, in our region. So one third of the disability in our region is due to uh, mental neurological substance use and suicide uh, uh, conditions. We know that the region of the Americas also has the highest prevalences of uh, common mental health disorders like uh, anxiety and depression. And to, uh, and, to, and to combine with this information, it's very important to mention that there is a high burden, there is a high prevalence of common mental health conditions, but in fact, there is also a high treatment gap. So in, as a region overall, we know that uh, the majority of people that need mental health care, they do not have uh, access to, to treatment. In some places in our region, this treatment gap can reach up to 80%. So imagine 80% of people with, with, uh, with mental health conditions not having the treatment that they would need uh, uh, to receive. To bring also another piece of this picture, we know that our region faces a, 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 a harsh history in terms of uh, uh, people living in long-term uh, uh, psychiatric institutions. So many countries still have those uh, environments where, where people are disconnected from family, they are disconnected from the community, they receive little in terms of uh, uh, rehabilitation and, and proper care, and many of those uh, old institutions are still uh, places where there are human rights uh, abuses. Uh, the region has put forward the declaration 30 years ago called the Declaration of Caracas with the regional commitment to end those long-term institutions and to shift the model towards community mental health care close uh, to the community, integrate mental health integrated into primary health care. There are advances, number of long-term psychiatric beds have been reducing, but there is still a long pathway to uh, advance. We also know that one mechanism to try to improve the situation of people living in those institutions is to, is to have a mental health laws 
that uh, are aligned with the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. But when we review the laws of many countries, we know that uh, there is again a long uh, road to, to, to advance in terms of uh, protecting autonomy, capacity of the decision, and, 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 and making sure that people with uh, psychosocial disabilities have the same rights as any other uh, people. So we, we also, uh, that's another piece of the picture, a history of long-term institutions in our region. And perhaps to complete uh, 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 with another detail of this picture that I'm trying to pass to you, uh, uh, suicide is a very important problem in our region. Of all WHO uh, uh, regions, the six WHO regions, our region, the Americas, is the one where the regional suicide rate has been decreased, uh, increasing in the last uh, uh, 20 years. We are at, uh, uh, regionally speaking, we are at uh, uh, nine but uh, 100,000, we have countries in our region with very high suicide rates. Uh, Guyana is one of them, Suriname is, is another one. Uh, uh, so uh, we know that there is an average of almost uh, 100,000 people dying per, uh, of suicide uh, per year in our region. Uh, the suicide mortality, as I've mentioned, has been increasing in our region at a rate of 17% in the last uh, uh, 20 years. So it's another problem that we have in our table and that we need to find uh, ways to address. We also acknowledge that there are countries and subregions that have been advancing, uh, uh, suicides have been decreasing, but there are subregions in our region where the suicide rate has been increasing over time. And this is mainly North America and the Southern uh, uh, Cone. The Caribbean as a subregion, although having a, a, a very high suicide rates, we know that those rates have been uh, uh, decreasing over time. So there is, uh, there is uh, good opportunities on, on building on lessons learned. As by the moment that we speak, uh, based on the last compilation of data that we have done, the, the seven countries that have a rate above 10 per 100,000 in the region are Guyana, Suriname, Uruguay, United States, Haiti, Canada, and, and Cuba. So these are the highest suicide rates in the region. Not the countries who have the highest number of people dying by suicide, which is no doubt the uh, uh, United States. So here I'm mentioning rates uh, per uh, 100,000. Uh, so this is a situation that in fact we have prior to COVID. And then to bring you another piece of that picture, and it's the last piece that I'm bringing to you now, we know that uh, in order to uh, face the challenges that I have explained to you, it's fundamental that we invest in mental health. We invest in expanding human resources in mental health. We in, we we put financial investment to scale up those services, to train uh, more, more people, to increase the capacity of the primary health care level, to connect the primary health care level to other systems of mental health care. But again, the public expenditure on, on, on mental health averages around 2% of the total health uh, spending in our region. So we are, uh, our conditions are responsible for uh, uh, one third of the disability, but in fact, only 2% of the health budget ends up going to, to mental health. And to make matters uh, uh, worse, 60% of that little funding tends to go to all the uh, psychiatric uh, institutions, uh, which is uh, not the best way to be close to the people that need care, to have that, that different forms of care, and to have uh, uh, people receiving uh, care uh, as close as possible to, 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 to where they live. So that's the situation that, that, that we face in the Americas. It's important that I also mention that more and more countries have been uh, developing policies, updating their laws, uh, uh, scaling up uh, uh, mental health services in, in the community. Uh, so uh, things are advancing. Uh, on one side, but th there is a lot that still needs to be able to be done, especially to try to uh, decrease the treatment gap, as we had mentioned. And then we have the pandemic that we are all going through now, and that we know that has a, a direct and an indirect impact on the mental health of, of populations. So we know already for, for almost two years that the pandemic causes widespread anxiety, 
panic, uh, feelings of hopelessness and uncertainty in, 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 in almost everyone. Uh, we know that the pandemic also exacerbates pre-existing mental health uh, uh, conditions. There are studies in our region that have documented that. The pandemic also brought uh, stigma towards certain groups of the populations. Uh, it, it made people uh, uh, be in uh, isolation. It uh, created uh, difficult uh, grieving processes when, when people lost close relatives and they could not perform the, the rituals that they were used to. And it in fact uh, created, uh, 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 increased uh, the, the possibility that people became socially uh, disconnected because of the, 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 the measures uh, uh, in terms of uh, physical uh, distancing. So it's expected and it has already been demonstrated that the pandemic uh, exacerbates mental health problems at the, at the population uh, uh, level. And uh, you, you see that there are many different ways that this happens. Uh, unemployment is another example, job insecurity, financial insecurity. Uh, uh, we also have reports of substance use increasing. You know, uh, many companies started to deliver uh, alcohol at home uh, uh, in many countries. So restrictions that were available before uh, were broken. Uh, people could uh, buy uh, alcohol through the through the internet, and uh, so it's more accessibility also to substances that uh, uh, it, it was available uh, before. It's also clear the situation of children far from school for almost uh, uh, two years. Now in some countries they, they are going back, but all the impact of uh, children not connecting to peers, not having life uh, education. And we should also not forget that many health services have been disrupted. So people could not have access to services that they, that they were used to have uh, uh, before. As I mentioned to you, there are studies in our region and we have been doing a compilation of those uh, uh, studies. And, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, the compilation that we have done, it's about to be uh, uh, published and uh, we will be sharing with you if, you're, if you are interested. But the studies that we have uh, uh, reviewed show uh, depression and anxiety currently uh, ranging from 20 to 60 percent of the general population uh, health professionals being also a population uh, at risk uh, we have studies showing one quarter of one quarter of health workers with moderate to severe depressive uh, symptoms studies among young people also showing uh, anxiety uh, depression as, as at rates higher than expected and some studies also give us a, 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 a better idea on populations who are more vulnerable who are at the highest risk. And these are ethnic minorities, indigenous populations, people with pre-existing mental health conditions, among others. There is a, uh, there is a study who has been conducted by, by the World Economic Forum, where in fact people were asked uh, many aspects of their life, but one of the questions was, uh, how uh, has been the, the change in your emotional and, and, and mental health since the, the, the beginning of the pandemic? So here you have uh, in many countries uh, participated in this big survey, countries in the Americas also participated. So you have almost 50% of people in, in, in most of the countries saying that uh, their mental health has gotten uh, worse. And then you have uh, around uh, 10 to 20% of people really describing that the, their mental health, their emotional status has gotten a lot uh, 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 worse. So then we have a deterioration of the mental health status of populations. So we would expect that in fact, uh, uh, there are systems in place to support people in these times that are, that are very difficult for, for, for everyone to go through. We have conducted together with the WHO two rounds of surveys where we try to better understand what is the status of health services, especially essential health services presently during the pandemic. We had the first round last year and we had the second round about two, three months ago. So uh, there were different questions, uh, focal points from ministries of health answered the questionnaire. And when we compiled the data, uh, we are able to compare, okay, which services are more disrupted, which services are less disrupted. And, and not to our surprise, mental, neurological and substance use disorders services are the most, are the ones that 
the majority of the countries described a disruption during the pandemic. So in fact, 60% of the countries in the region, out of 27 countries who answered the questionnaire, they described that their mental health services have been disrupted with around 10% of those 60% describing that more than 50% of, of mental health services have been uh, disrupted. So uh, unfortunately, we are leaders in terms of disruption of health services during the pandemic. Just to give you an idea, 60% of the countries reported disruption on mental health services, as I have described, immunization 55%, communicable diseases 49%. So we have a big problem in front of us. Uh, when people need the most, the services are disrupted. And there are many reasons for that. We know uh, people have not cannot go to the health service to the mental health services that they used to go many times we know that some countries have shifted professionals from mental health services to other types of services to respond to the emergency there are there are many reasons uh, i think uh, uh, they are lo uh, logic to understand the reasons but the fact is that then the mental health services are the one uh, uh, facing the the challenge of how to address the needs of people when they need the most but in fact uh, the services are are, are not uh, functioning as before. And as I mentioned the uh, uh, suicide uh, before, I, I will mention here again, because in fact, uh, in the same survey, uh, in this second round that I had mentioned to you, uh, almost 60% of the countries described that their suicide prevention programs have also been uh, disrupted. So you see, uh, not only here when I'm talking about suicide prevention, but also when I was talking about general mental health services disruption, we are talking about services that many times they save lives. Uh, 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 a treatment center that uh, helps people with alcohol withdrawal is a life-saving uh, activity. An emergency psychiatric services services that uh, uh, help people in an acute psychotic crisis or people with a suicidal ideation or suicidal intent is also a, a life-saving service. And those services, unfortunately, have been uh, severely uh, disrupted. Well, uh, at the same side, uh, at, uh, on the same side, the UN and the WHO have been trying to bring mental health on the top of the agenda during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, there has been uh, different calls for action uh, in terms of uh, identifying and putting mental health as a major priority during the COVID-19 response. There is a policy brief by the United Nations that was launched last year uh, describing the COVID-19 and the need for action on, on, on mental health. Uh, Dr. Tedros also uh, emphasized the importance of integrating mental health uh, from a multi-sectoral persp uh, perspective in all the elements of the emergency uh, response. Uh, COVID has also, uh, uh, mental health has also been COVID in, in, in different funding opportunities in terms of uh, global humanitarian response uh, 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 plans. Several guidelines and several material have been also uh, uh, produced uh, in the international uh, scenario. But we, we, we need that in order to be able to address the challenges that I have described to you up to now, it's fundamental that we think mental health from a multi-sectoral perspective. We, it's not time anymore that only us health professionals or only us health professionals take mental health seriously. We need to think about a whole of society uh, approach. We need to work comprehensively and in a coordinated way. Everyone has a job to do in terms of improving the mental health status of, of populations. When we have those mental health conversations, we need to include healthcare in general, but we also need to include education. We need to include the employment sectors. We need to include the judiciary. We need to include housing, social welfare, and all other relevant sectors, because all of them have something to do. And especially if we also take into consideration the important social determinants of mental health that have been so impacted during, during, during this pandemic. So again, a whole of society approach 
with the commitment of everyone of all levels of government is what is really necessary to address the enormous challenge that I have described up to now. So we need leadership and we need governance. governance. We need uh, uh, to update uh, countries' uh, uh, plans or create mental health plans where they still do not exist or have uh, uh, expired. And that is something that we also have been trying to do a lot with countries is to support countries to create coordinating mechanisms in, me in mental health and psychosocial support to act in a coordinated way in the response uh, 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 to, the, to the emergency. With the burden that I have described to you up to now and the increased burden that the pandemic brings, this coordinated response need to find possibilities to increase the coverage on community mental health services to support adults and children with mental health problems. Uh, we need to take this opportunity and the visibility that COVID has brought to mental health because that's, that's, uh, that's something that the pandemic has brought uh, probably People did not speak about mental health as we speak today. All of us somehow have been affected or have a family member affected and is facing, facing the emotional burden that the pandemic brings. And this brings visibility because this brings recognition of the role and the importance of mental health in our lives. So this, is, this window of opportunity needs to be used for us to work together to increase the availability of mental health at the primary healthcare level by training different actors on psychosocial skills and mental health. Everyone has a, a role to play. Mental health is not only the job of professionals. Uh, I'm talking a lot about services here, but as we mentioned the determinants of mental health, we need to find ways that promotion and prevention is also prioritized. Uh, policies that are created during the COVID and will be created afterwards on, on, on poverty reduction, on housing and on un unemployment to help people to, 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 to advance uh, and, and face the, the, the hardship that the COVID has brought, need to also include mental health elements. So that's another opportunity that we have to work in a multidisciplinary uh, uh, way. Uh, uh, as children are going back to school, that's another big opportunity that we have to integrate mental health elements into the school uh, environment. And no doubt, if we want to do all this that we are describing up to now, to be able to learn if we are doing right or if we are doing, doing wrong and to adapt to, to whatever might be needed to, to adapt, uh, be, adapt based on lessons learned, we need to strengthen mental health information systems, uh, improve the use of mental health indicators collect better data so this can all inform the decisions that we need to be to be taken so we at PAHO we also have been trying to 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 play our role we have been very close to countries during the pandemic uh, uh, we were able also uh, to increase uh, our team the mental health unit uh, that had uh, 10 people in the past we went up to 53 people at some uh, recently consultants who have been helping us to deliver many courses together with ministries of health. We have done courses on, on coordination mechanisms in mental health and psychosocial support in Spanish, uh, in English. Uh, we have expanded the courses on MNH gap, uh, especially training uh, tutors so they could uh, scale up training at the country level. A lot of support and we even created a community of practice on remote mental health interventions because this is also a lesson learned during the pandemic that we can do much more in mental health when we bring uh, uh, digital interventions to, 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 to our uh, uh, field. And, in the, and, and from a multidisciplinary perspective also, we have been doing and delivering courses on uh, literacy uh, in mental health, uh, courses for journalists on mental health and, and talking to the media, uh, community leaders, uh, so, and, and there is a lot of material on mental health, communication on mental health that we have developed and they are all available in our uh, uh, website. Uh, so please access, uh, we have a specific web page on, on mental health and, and COVID that puts all this that I'm saying today together and, and has a material that uh, can be used in different situations when communicating about mental health, when deciding to scale up uh, services uh, and also helping to monitor uh, uh, 
mental health status of populations and mental health and the development of mental health services. So I think my last message here to you is really to, to uh, stimulate all of us to take the opportunity that COVID brings and uh, find uh, all possible opportunities to scale up uh, 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 mental health. Uh, it's an opportunity that uh, will strengthen the response that we have today towards this emergency, but that will also help to strengthen the system, the mental health systems that already exist, that will help people to go through the pandemic and after the pandemic. And, and when mental health systems, they are, they are strengthened, they will also be better prepared to future emergencies that we are going to face. COVID is near, it's not the only emergency that we are going through. We have climate change. We have the risk of, uh, of uh, uh, disasters uh, very high in some uh, uh, specific uh, uh, regions in our, in our region of the Americas. So uh, mental health is and it will continue to be very important and, and, and relevant for the, for the future. Thank you again for, for, for this opportunity. Thank you for organizing this uh, conference in such a very uh, important time. And uh, uh, please uh, reach me in case uh, anything else is needed from our side. We are here to support. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Renato. Well, thank you, um, Renato, um, for the presentation. Uh, there are there are many issues that you that you brought out um, uh, that I didn't know uh, as well. Um, there are challenges with uh, with 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 COVID uh, for mental health, um, but as you indicated, there are also opportunities. Um, the highlights on mental health uh, gives us the opportunity to to scale up uh, uh, mental health uh, in the services as well. My question is. And uh, I've, I've, um, I've sent a note to those online um, to, to ask you no know, questions as well. My question is, you mentioned moving from institutional mental health to community mental health. Um, with the advent of, of, of COVID, a lot of persons are already within the communities. What do we do to cement this post-COVID so that, like you said, um, we do not... Um, and disconnect persons once they are in psychiatric you know, hospitals. Over. Renato, please unmute your mic. Your mic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question, William. You see, uh, I think one of the, the challenges that countries face is, is to have a, a robust mental health system in place where every and all pieces of of the puzzle they are put together so if if we have people and in institutions and we advance with the process of the institutionalization we need to make sure that the person goes back to the community and receive the necessary care to avoid that the person will come back to the psychiatric institution. So we need to have uh, uh, ambulatory services for mental health. Those ambulatory services need to uh, be able to be connected to the psychiatric institution so they are prepared to receive the person when the person comes out of the hospital. Of course, then the person goes to the community. So you need to have a primary health care that has skills on mental health to be able to follow up that person where he or she lives. So it, it, it's a whole system that needs to be in place with the connection between the dots. So a primary health care that it's able to support people, but at some situations, uh, the complexity of the, of, of, of the condition might not be enough for the primary health care to cater. So then the person is connected to a secondary level of care. There are situations that the person might enter a crisis again and the family and the community is not able to support in the adequate ma manner. So that person might need to be hospitalized, ideally in a bed in a general hospital. The stay should be as short as possible. And then when the person starts to recuperate, the person goes back to the community and continues to be supported by 
by that system. I think that's that's the way that we embrace people with uh, with mental health issues by having a system that addresses needs of the person at different points through her uh, uh, through the challenges that the person will face in terms of in terms of of, of mental health. I think this is an area that uh, uh, many countries need to advance, connecting those dots to have a mental health system that embraces the, 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 the user of services. Yes, thank you. Um, Renato, my, my, my other question is um, the issue of destigmatization. I think um, with, with COVID, now we have, a, as you said earlier, um, there is a, a high rate of anxiety and some amount of depression. So that I think now um, a, greater, a greater number of the population now have mental health uh, 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 um, symptomatology. Therefore, is, is it an opportunity for us to say, okay, now we are all experiencing uh, you know, some, some symptoms of, uh, of, uh, uh, of mental health disorders, and as a result, we we can find a way to destigmatize um, uh, uh, mental health uh, you no know, conditions, so that persons are not just cast out of society and put in institutions. Over. Yeah, no, uh, you're right, William. Uh, in terms of uh, stigma and and trying to combat stigma, uh, one piece of work that we have been trying to do here, we have launched this year two uh, uh, anti-stigma courses, mainly for health professionals. This is a collaboration between PAHO and the uh, Mental Health Commission of, of, of Canada. And we know that a key ingredient on combating stigma towards mental health issues is to strongly involve people with lived experiences. So the, 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 those courses that we have been conducting uh, for health professionals on combating stigma, they are led and many times the, most of the sessions are done by people who faced mental health issues and openly come up and describe uh, what they have gone through and uh, what they have been able to achieve. So then the attendees, they see, well, uh, they are not that different uh, 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 from me. Uh, look at what they have achieved. So I think this moves the community towards reducing stigma. As I said, those courses we have been doing for health professionals, because we know that unfortunately, many times also health professionals uh, 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 are, are challenged by the stigma that they face towards uh, mental health in general. And this blocks their capacity to talk openly and to ask proper questions to people with mental health issues. But the same approach can also be used towards the general population, involving people with lived experiences, uh, of course, if they want and if they were. Uh, willing to, to, to do, so the people see that, uh, well, that's not something that it's behind, uh, mental health is not something that it's behind those uh, closed walls. It's something that, uh, as you said, affects us all. I have faced my issues also during the pandemic. There were points that I really believe I was not anymore able to cope, and I had to find mechanisms to get help my, myself, uh, because that's the reality. But thanks so much, um, uh, Renato. Um, I think I, I, I'll give you the, 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 the opportunity to, to indicate uh, you know, some closing you know, remarks, Renato. Thanks, uh, William. You see, uh, I think we are talking about opportunities here. Uh, we, we have been talking uh, many years about uh, there is a big problem, there is a big burden, there is a big, uh, uh, there is a big uh, uh, treatment gap. Uh, uh, but I think we are in a momentum to talk about uh, opportunities. I see all countries doing uh, uh, a lot in terms of, of, of mental health. And the same questionnaire that I mentioned to you that uh, we asked the countries uh, how things were going, uh, most of the countries, in fact, answered that uh, 
mental health was integrated into the emergency response. And this is very positive. Uh, we reached the momentum where people are, are aware about the importance of mental health. Uh, the, but the problem that we face is that this is not uh, uh, backed up by financial investment. So uh, having uh, the knowledge and uh, knowing that it's a problem and knowing what to do uh, is great. But we also need the uh, uh, co commitments in terms of financial uh, investment. So that's our call to, to countries now. Uh, if you want to invest, uh, uh, please increase uh, the proportion that you invest towards uh, mental health. Uh, uh, we know that there is return. There are several studies on uh, return over investment that shows that uh, you put money on mental health, it reverts more to, to you as a society to you as a government, because people function better, they are able to uh, go back to work and the society profits as a role. So there is economic uh, 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 feedback on investing in, in, in mental health. So, so uh, that, that, that's uh, what I uh, really invite everyone to think about and, and, and help us all to move forward. Thanks, William. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Renata. Uh, I think I uh, I'll end uh, our discussions um, unless I see any more hands. Um, others, I'll, I'll end our discussions by indicating a few points. And I think Renato made us aware that there's a need to invest in human resources in mental health, as well as uh, uh, financial resources. I think um, uh, all governments, um, and certainly in Guyana as well, all governments in the, in the sub-region as well as in Guyana, we need to put a lot of resources in mental health. Um, as Renato said, mental health um, uh, is usually one of the neglected areas. Um, and, um, and once someone is put in an institution, that is it. And very little money is put into mental health to start off with. And a lot of that very little that is put there is put in the institution. I think we need to continue to and look at uh, increasing community mental health, uh, both in the area of uh, human resource, uh, as well as in the area of um, uh, uh, financial resource and material resources as well, whatever is needed. The other thing I would like to uh, mention um, uh, with respect to the human resource is to make sure that we have all cadres of healthcare workers within mental health. So we need public health, me mental health nurses, we need them, um, community mental health nurses, we need um, uh, psychologists, we need psychiatrists, we need social workers, and um, we need these persons to be able to function. And as Renato said, uh, once we have good mental health service in, 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 in the country, pro productivity also increases and everybody wins. I think one other point that uh, Renato made, and I would like to um, uh, come back to that, is um, there's a need to have everyone on board. We need the healthcare workers on board, we need education on board, we need housing on board, we need local government on board, we need community um, uh, and, and social services in the, uh, in the ministries on board. We also need civil society, we need faith-based organization. All of us need to, know to, be, um, to be on board so that we should not only look at um, the, the negatives of, um, of, uh, of COVID on, on mental health and the, the neglect uh, by our governments and um, various governments in, in the area of, uh, of mental health, but look at the opportunities that, um, that we can get as a result of what is happening. Um, I have learned a lot uh, uh, from, from uh, Renato, and uh, I am hoping that um, our, our guests online uh, have as well.